You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from benchside to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I am your host, Kathleen Wiley. Today, I am joined by Celeste Adams, Nurse Navigator at Intermountain Healthcare in St. George, Utah, and member of the ONS Intermountain Chapter to discuss Nurse Navigator's role in helping patients and caregivers understand how genomic advancements affect cancer prevention, screening, diagnosis, staging, and treatment planning. Celeste, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be able to discuss such exciting advances in uh, cancer care. Well, we're so glad you're here. Cancer care is in the midst of a massive paradigm shift. Cancer care providers, both current and future, underprepared for the rapid application of genomic discoveries and the changes needed in cancer care delivery. Cancer care providers must know the science behind genomics, apply the latest evidence in practice, and translate the information to patients and families. And that is in part a critical role of oncology nurse navigators in the healthcare system. So Celeste, to get us started off, what is genomics and how is it used in cancer care? Genomics is officially the study of the genome which is all of the instructions inside of every cell of your body. The DNA, which makes up the genes, which makes up the chromosomes, these are the instructions on how to build and maintain and repair you, your body. And when we get some broken bits or mutations in those instructions, the cells can't follow the instructions the way they were originally written, and you have the potential to get cancer. And studying those broken bits or those mutations in the instructions can help tell us how likely you are to get cancer, which allows us to be more preventive. And they can also give us clues as to which particular treatments will potentially work or which ones may not work. Great. Thank you. So then why is genomics important in the role of the nurse navigator specifically? Well, as we know, our patients are doing more and more research themselves with Dr. Google. And so there is a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding. And we as nurse navigators can help clarify that. We can also help our physicians, help our doctors to help remind them about ordering tests. Here at Intermountain, we try to get genomic testing on all of our stage four patients. And sometimes our docs just forget about that. Or sometimes if we're dealing with a particular disease, sometimes they just need a tag to say, remember, Remember to get the EGFR on this one or something like that so we can help. That's so important to have all of that baseline information before we get into treatment planning. And so can you elaborate on some of the key terms that an oncology nurse navigator would want to be familiar with when it comes to genomics? Oh, yes. There are a lot of these terms. And I think the two that get mixed up the most are germline and somatic mutations. Now, germline mutations are the ones that you got from your parents. You have the possibility of passing them on to your kids. Germline mutations are the things that are studied by geneticists, and these are the things that can predict the likelihood of you getting cancer down the road. For instance, Ladies with a BRCA1 gene mutation or a BRCA1 gene mutation can have up to an 85% greater likelihood of developing breast cancer. That's a problem. And so a geneticist may recommend to them that they start earlier doing their mammograms or that they do a alternating mammograms with breast MRIs every six months so that we can catch those when they're little. Or they may even suggest that they get a prophylactic, prophylactic mastectomy. And we couldn't do that if we didn't know about having that gene. And so then the somatic side of things, can you elaborate on that terminology? 
Yes. Somatic mutations developed later on in life because of things like exposure to asbestos or smoking or not eating enough vegetables. These are the things of what we typically think of when we say genomics. They cannot be passed on to your children, but they help us direct treatment decisions about cancer care. And these can tell us about sensitivity or resistance to particular treatments. For instance, a brain tumor that does not have the MGMT methylated gene will probably not respond to Temidar, which is the standard of care for that, for gliomas. Another term that I think is very important is variant or mutation. Sometimes in the copying and the duplicating of our DNA, there are mistakes that are made. But any gene can be broken in a bunch of different ways. Maybe one little bit is left out or a big bit or there's a stutter and an extra bit gets put in or maybe it fuses to another part or any other number of issues. Those variants are then named with the gene and and then numbers and letters added to keep track of that. So you'll notice uh, there's a BRAF V600E variation. That's a very specific mutation for that BRAF gene. But there's other ones. And while we're talking about this BRCA1 gene, there are over a thousand different ways that that can be broken that cause cancer. Some genes, in another term here, some genes are broken, but we don't know if they actually cause cancer. And those are called variants of unknown significance. And you'll see a list of these that pop up on the genomic report. We're studying these as fast as we can, but for now, we just don't know if they're actionable, if we can do anything about them. Another term is wild type. Wild type is a term that we use for what the normal gene should be. So, for instance, if we do not have a KRAS mutation, then we say that the patient has KRAS wild type, which is just another way of saying they have the normal KRAS gene there. I think another thing that comes in these reports are biomarkers, and we use these biomarkers to see if the patient might respond to immunotherapy. And there's three of those that we really look at a lot. One is MSI. Now, MSI is not a gene. It stands for microsatellite instability. But if the tumor is unstable, the more unstable it is, the more likely it is that it will respond to immunotherapy. TMB is tumor mutational burden. Again, that's not a gene, but that's in the genomics. It is essentially a percentage of the instructions that are broken or how much of the, the DNA is messed up. And the more it's messed up, the better likelihood it is that it will respond to immunotherapy. And PDL1 is another one that's the protein on the outside of the cell. This camouflages the cell so that the person's immune system won't recognize it as foreign. And so if they have a lot of this PD-L1 protein, then again, the more there is of this, the more likely it is that that patient will respond to immunotherapy. That's a lot of terms, but they're, they're very important. I think that's so helpful. These are terms that nurses, especially nurse navigators, are seeing every day, communicating to their patients every day. And I, I think it's very important to know that these aren't necessarily all used interchangeably. They have different roles throughout the trajectory. So I that those clarifications are very helpful, Celeste. You started off talking about germline genetic testing and gave the BRCA1 as a, a specific example there. Nurse navigators are so commonly referring patients to or for genetic counseling. What does the nurse navigator need to know about referring a patient to a genetics professional? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Germline testing tells us what mutations you got from your parents. So that definitely means that one or both of your parents have that mutation as well. And it also means that your siblings have a 50% chance of getting that mutation. And it also means that you can pass it on to your children. That's a lot of people that can be affected by this information. And a genetics counselor is able to make sense of that and help determine what 
those mutations really mean and the statistics involved and can give suggestions about how to deal with those things. This is typically done by a sputum sample, so it's very easy to do. They just get mailed off. Some people are concerned that their family is going to be obligated to be tested, and that just simply is not true. But the family members can get tested, and most insurances will pay for that, for them to get tested if, they, if the patient finds out that indeed they do have these mutations. Some people are very concerned about having this information used against them like in their job or their insurances or something like that. And so I always like to tell my patients that there is a GINA, the GINA Act, which is the Genomic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which says that they can't be discriminated at because of these mutations, any mutations that are found in the, in the workplace. They can't be discriminated in their health insurance, so that won't be a factor. Their health or their current life insurance will not be affected, but it could affect if they changed to a life insurance after they get this. So they should be aware of that. Some of my patients will have just the the parent will get the testing and then the children will act as if they had the mutation without even getting the test. So that's another option too. And those genetic counselors can be a big help on that. There's another important thing that goes along with that, and that is that some people, for instance, are patients with colorectal cancer. They may have Lynch syndrome, and that brings up the possibility of getting other kinds of cancers. So if somebody just looked at their mom and said, oh, I know mom had colorectal cancer. Well, if we know that mom had Lynch syndrome, then maybe now these children, if they're positive for Lynch syndrome, also have increased risk for uterine or stomach cancers or other things that they need to be watching out for. Thank you so much. So let's talk a little bit now about patients who would be referred for for somatic testing to determine if precision medicine is right for a particular patient. How do those conversations between a navigator and and a patient who's considering somatic testing, how how are those different? How are those the same? What, What do those conversations look like? Somatic or genomic testing is actually done on the tumor. So a piece of the biopsy or a piece of the resection is what is tested. They don't have to do anything different than that. And uh, those pieces are typically still sitting there. So even if a patient comes to us six months after the biopsy or a year after the resection, we can still do genomic testing on that. One of the things that I talk to our patients about this is as we're following the NCCN guidelines, we're using that basically based on where that tumor is located. Genomic testing actually goes down into the DNA and looks at mutations that are specific to that tumor and to that specific person. And they typically get pretty excited about having that done. They want it personalized like that. Most of the time we do find mutations. A good chunk of those are actionable, meaning that we do have medication that will target those. Some of those mutations do fall under the current guidelines for their disease, so it's sometimes not as helpful as we would like. And we typically find a lot of mutations that are of unknown significance. We're still learning. The main reason that we do this testing is to give us options because options are always good. We have got a lot of indications of why we should do the testing, like knowing if a colon patient is KRAS or NRAS wild type would allow us to use cetuximab, which typically would not work if they were KRAS mutated. And if the patient is pdl one positive or TMB or MSI high, like we've already talked about. Those are the biomarkers that are going to allow us to use immunotherapy, which is fabulous. And amazingly enough, the FDA has approved us to use Pembro. It's the first one that's they call it tumor agnostic. 
that you're actually treating a mutation. You're not treating the organ. And that's just exciting. And of course, NCCM guidelines are telling us that we ought to do somatic testing on every pancreatic patient, regardless of their stage. And we here at Intermountain tried to do genomic testing on every stage four. It's just a fabulous tool. Yeah, there's so many advances in cancer care, especially with all these new agents that are being approved. And without genomic testing, it's, you know, it, it's helping us to be a lot more precise with our treatments, knowing for which patients they might be more effective. So it, it's really helping, I think, providers and, and clinicians make sense of all these new approvals to know when to actually use them and, and when not to. So what key concepts would a nurse navigator want to be familiar with when it comes to genomics? Oh, that's a great question. I think that there are several. I think one of the big concerns is is expense. And so people should know that Medicare will generally pay for this in advanced or metastatic cancers. And we're seeing that the commercial payers are following suit on that. These do take a while to do. So it typically takes two to three weeks to run these tests. The suggestions that come back are typically orals, which of course we know can also be expensive. But amazingly enough, we have data that shows that even despite the expense of the test and the expense of those oral medications, we have been able to prove that it can still increase their quality and quantity of life and still be less expensive than traditional treatments, which is staggering to me. And then I think one more thing that they need to know is probably that this is not a one and done thing. As we know, cancer became cancer because it mutated and cancer continues to mutate. And the treatments that we do can sometimes encourage that mutation. And so if we've got a patient who's, it's been a year or so since our last genomics and we're running out of options or something, get a biopsy or get a resection and do the test again and maybe something new has popped up and we can treat that. Options are good. Yes, options are very good. So what kind of questions are patients and caregivers asking navigators about genomic testing and how do you respond to them? Probably the most common question I get is that if they have a mutation, why can't they use that targeted medication right now? Why do they have to try something else first? And the simple reason is that we follow the data and the FDA has approved medications and the NCCN guidelines suggest certain first-line treatments based on the data that has been gathered. So we want to give the patient the best possible outcomes. And for now, until more data is gathered, about genomics results. That means following the guidelines for at least one regimen. But we are gathering data at breakneck speed and we are seeing great outcomes. Did you notice that now atezolizumab is now first line in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with a high PD-L1? I anticipate that we're going to see more and more of these targeted medications move up to first line as we see the data come through. The other question that I get an awful lot is why not, why pay for this test? Why not just do a 23andMe or an Ancestry? And I've even had one patient who had people come door to door trying to do a uh, DNA test. The answer is, is that those tests are looking for different things. Yes, they are on your DNA, but they're looking more for your ancestry. And they've got a little bit of health things, but even a tinier pinch of cancer things. So like I mentioned before, there's over a thousand variations or variants of the BRCA1 gene. If that ancestry or 23andMe tests for two of those variants of the BRCA1 gene, and you've got five of the variants that they didn't test, you're going to come out of there thinking with a false sense of security, thinking that you don't have BRCA1, but you really may. Or maybe they don't even test for BRCA1 at all, and now you're really up a creek. And so, so no, I think it's very important that you get a reliable health DNA test. And the other things that those things don't come with is genetic counseling that is so important to help you make sense of what those things mean and what you should be doing with your family. 
Absolutely. You referenced data coming in at breakneck speed. And I think that sometimes data is coming in faster than clinicians know what to do with it. And so we're sometimes left with more questions than answers with all of the data. What are some common misconceptions about genomics and its impact on treatment? Ah, that's a great question too. One misconception is that it will definitely work. If you have the mutation and you take the medicine, it should work. If we find a HER2 mutation, then it's very easy to say, oh, go take some Herceptin and you should be you should be good. But we're finding out that it doesn't necessarily always work that way. We know that using Herceptin in a HER2 positive breast cancer patient works pretty well. We found that in some colon patients, it can work pretty well. But if we find a HER2 mutation in a bladder cancer patient, the medication doesn't typically work so well. So so we are trying to find out where do these things work and where do they not work and especially why. Why do they not work in those places? Another misconception is that this will lead to a cure. Remembering, of course, that genomics is typically done on stage four patients and that that's where the FDA allows us to use those medications. We know that stage four cancer patients almost by definition are not able to be cured. But we can definitely give those patients an increase in the quality and quantity of their life. And that is a huge impact. And when you want to talk about impact, I'd like to tell you about two patients. One of our first patients had stage four colon cancer, and he had blown through all of the uh, regimens. He was on oxygen. He was in a wheelchair. He was miserable. He was dying. And we did genomics on him. We tested the tumor and found out that he did have one of these HER2 mutations in colon cancer. And so we gave him that typically breast cancer medication. And it wasn't long before that tumor just shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. And he came out of the wheelchair. He came off of the oxygen and he was, he got so good that he actually went back to work. This is a stage four patient that we thought was dying. Wow. And it ended up that he lived for another two years. And during those two years, he went back to work. He saw one of his sons graduate from high school. He saw another son graduate from college and get married. And I think that everybody in that family would agree that that had a fabulous impact on not only his life, but all of his, his family. And we see results like this. We've had another patient and he had a stage four GE junction tumor, 13 centimeters of a GE junction tumor. It was massive. And he had spread all throughout his abdomen and his chest and even up into his neck. And he had failed all of his treatments too. And he was dying. Stage four, massive spread. The genomics on him showed a positive PDL1. So he got some immunotherapy. He got immunotherapy for a year and had a complete remission, no evidence of disease. He's now been off of all treatment for three years and still has no sign of disease. That's the impact that we can have. Now, obviously, that's a fabulous case, but wow, everybody deserves to have those options. Absolutely. I think those are such powerful examples of the role the navigator plays in advocating for that testing to be done, that diagnosis and, and throughout treatment. And as you said in the beginning of our conversation, it's often the navigators asking, have they had these tests done? Do you have experience in, you know, when patients are maybe coming seeking a second opinion or have been treated initially at a different center and then transfer to you and maybe your center is now picking up on the need for this somatic testing. Do you have examples of that? And, and how do you communicate with your patients when you feel as though maybe a ball was dropped and, and testing is happening late in treatment? Yes, we get this a lot. I get a lot of calls from people all over the country. I've had people outside of the country who call because they've Googled my doctor. They've found out that Intermountain's associated with this kind of thing. It's amazing to me that they're 
oncologists have told them that this is still out there, that this is not not very well tested, and that this is a crapshoot for them to to do this testing. But they know that if if they can have more options, they want those options and they seek those options and they're willing to travel a long distance to get those options. We don't know everything, but what we do know is enough to help a lot of these people. And we will just be continue learning, learning, learning. Absolutely. How do you stay up to date with the new science and technology of genomic testing and targeted therapies? And what do you recommend for your fellow nurse navigators who want some education on this? Well, I'm uh, fortunate in that I get to go to the molecular tumor boards that we have because we do this testing. I mean, we actually run the testing at our uh, facility. And so we I get to go to the molecular tumor boards where people, physicians and scientists call in from across the country to discuss these findings and then prioritize those suggestions of what they're going to do. So I keep learning a lot by the ability to do that. But obviously, most facilities don't have a molecular tumor board. One of the things that I get to do is I get to help with the match and the taper clinical trials that our facility is using. Those are based on the genomics specifically. They are variant driven. They're supported by Big Pharma to see how targeting those mutations in other organs than the FDA has already approved will work. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And obviously the ONS journals, they always have good articles and new things in there about that that we all want to keep up on. Could you explain to our listeners what resources you use to integrate genomics into your practice? Well, besides all the learning that nurse navigators need to do to stay up to date on these things, I think the biggest resources that we need are our boldness, the willingness to ask questions and the willingness to learn and the willingness to go talk with your docs and open your mouth and advocate for your patient. Absolutely. Such such great advice. How do you see genomics influencing oncology care and the nurse navigator role in the future? I absolutely see or would love to see that genomic testing becomes reflex testing. That if somebody puts a has a biopsy or has a resection and it shows up as cancer, that it just automatically gets sent for genomic testing. I also anticipate that we will see more and more of these genomic-driven treatments becoming first line. And this will absolutely be something that nurse navigators will need to know about. Absolutely. That'll be exciting. What is something about genomics and the nurse navigator that isn't often discussed, but you wished people knew more about? You can see I'm a fan of uh, genomics and how important this is. I just wish more people knew about it and more people knew how important it is and how what a fantastic tool, preventive screening, treatment directions, options, all of those things, it just affects the whole care continuum. As nurse navigators, we're involved in that whole thing. And genomics is a fabulous tool in this fight, in this war against cancer. Why would you want to fight this one-handed? Use the, the tools that you've been given. Absolutely. That's a great analogy. You know, in wrapping up today, is there anything else that you would want to share with a navigator who is, you know, trying to guide their patients through genetic and genomic testing and the results who just might want to learn more about it? Go do it. (laughs) Go do it. Go learn. Go ask questions. Find out about it. Get excited about it and then share these Share these tools with your patients. They want to know about this. They are desperate for any help. Absolutely. And it's rare that we're seeing approvals coming out of the FDA right now in in the oncology world that don't have some sort of implications around genomic testing. So this is definitely here to stay. And it sounds like in our conversation conversation today, it, it will be growing in the future and being used as first line treatment. Celeste, thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise. I know our listeners certainly appreciate it. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. 
Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org.